The Beowulf poet suddenly surprises us by skipping over 500 plus years of the story. We learn in a few lines that Hyalek dies fighting the Frisians. Despite the promise of Hyalek's kingdom in the last section, the poet tells us that Hyalek, the shelter of Herdred's shield, proved useless against the fierce aggression of the Sheeflings. This is the first clear note of many in this section that tell of the failure of kings and kingdoms. Then we learn that Beowulf becomes king and rules for 50 winters, and he rules well, growing old and wise as warden of the land. Just as quickly, we learn that a dragon enters Ye- threatens Yatland. Within a few lines, the central conflict of the last section is set, the wise but aged king against an age-old evil. We don't learn the story of Beowulf's coronation until after the dragon has been introduced. Then we learn that Beowulf is the only Yetish warrior to survive in the battle that kills Hyalak. He swims back to Yetland, where Hagit offers him the crown, knowing her son is too young to rule. Despite the weakened condition of his kingless people, Beowulf again demonstrates his loyalty as Thane by refusing the throne and recognizing the hereditary right of the prince. Beowulf serves the crown prince as counselor and chief Thane. He uses his strength and reputation to give the young king authority. The poet says he did provide support for the prince, honored and minded him until he matured as the ruler of Yetland. Beowulf refuses the crown in a way that brings it greater honor. This action shows that Beowulf has held fast to Hrothgar's exhortations to abandon pride and seek wisdom his entire life. Beowulf could have taken the throne and increased his glory with the blessing of all the Yates, but instead he chooses to remain the servant of all the Yates by protecting the hereditary line of the king, thus guarding against civil war and maintaining the peace established by Hyalek. When Herdred dies in another battle against the Swedes, Beowulf finally takes up the crown, and he becomes a good kinning. Only three kings in the poem are described this way, Shield Shivson, Hrothgar, and now Beowulf, who has excelled himself in daring and in danger until the day arrived when he had to come face to face with the dragon. The ancient dragon, or worm in the Old English, who ravages Yetland, is awakened from his slumber when a thief pillages the worm hoard. When the dragon discovers the thief's work, it rippled down the rock, writhing in anger. Line 2288. It scorches the earth around its barrow, searching for the trespasser who had troubled his sleep. The dragon began to belch out flames and burn bright homesteads. There was a hot glow that scared everyone, for the vile skywinger would leave nothing alive in his wake. Everywhere the havoc he wrought was in evidence. Far and near, the Yate nation bore the brunt of his brutal assaults and virulent hate. He had singed the land, swathed it in flame, in fire and burning. Its attack culminates in the destruction of Beowulf's mead hall. His own home, the the poet tells us, the best of buildings had been burned to a cinder, the throne room of the Yates. Like a true interlaced artwork, the poem has now come full circle. It begins and ends with a monster destroying the mead hall of a good king. But Grendel, though monstrous, was still descended from man. The dragon, on the other hand, is an evil more ancient even than Cain, more ancient and more sinister. The dragon represents man's first enemy, the angel serpent who caused our first parents' fatal fall. And Beowulf's final fight symbolizes man's archetypal struggle with an evil that seems to never weaken. Beowulf has been fighting monsters and men his whole life, but no matter how many monsters he slays, there are still more. In his famous Beowulf essay called The Monsters and the Critics, Tolkien writes that other than the world-encircling serpent in Norse mythology, there are only two other significant dragons in Norse legend. Fafnir and Beowulf's Bane. Fafnir, who appeared in who appears in the saga of the Volsungs, was originally a dwarf whose gold lust caused him to murder his own brother and steal his father's gold hoard. The dwarf's internal work uh, internal wickedness works itself outward, transforming his bodily form into a dragon. Tolkien explains that both Fafnir and the dragon in Beowulf 
are more a personification of malice, greed, destruction, the evil side of heroic life, and of the undiscriminating cruelty of fortune that distinguishes not good or bad, the evil aspect of all life. But we have to be careful not to allegorize the dragon. It is not merely a symbol for demonic evil incarnate, but also a living, fire-breathing creature. It must be killed and conquered, just as every monstrous beast must, but fighting it comes at great risk and terrible cost. A sense of impending doom pervades this section. The poet gives several direct statements that the battle will go ill for Beowulf, but he also mentioned Hyalak's failure as king at the beginning of the section and tells how the dragon's gold hoard was collected by the last surviving member of an ancient people ruined by war. The poet includes the speech this lone survivor gives as he lays the gold in the earth. Now earth, hold what earls once held, and heroes can no more. It was mined from you first by honorable men. My own people have been ruined by war. One by one they went down to death, looked their last on sweet life in the hall. His once honorable, once heroic race could do nothing against the ravages of war. The destruction of bloodthirsty feuding and the lust for revenge that the poet has been warning against throughout the poem. The survivor then looks around him and laments all that he has lost. The companies have departed, the hard helmet hasped with gold, no trembling harp, no tuned timber, no tumbling hawk swerving through the hall, no swift horse pawing the courtyard. And then he concludes his sorrowful lament by declaring, Pillage and slaughter have emptied the earth of entire peoples. This is the fate of all mead halls, all fellowships, all peoples, all civilizations, says the poet. No city is permanent. Not Egypt, not Babylon, not Carthage, not Rome, not even America. No matter how noble, gracious, courageous, heroic, and honorable a people may be, there are monsters within and without that ravage cities and societies into rubble, dust, and memory. Tolkien stresses that this is one of the major themes of the poem. That man, each man, and all men, and all their works shall die. This is a reality borne out by history and experience, a reality that Beowulf and the Yates are about to learn firsthand, and it is a reality that no people no matter how prosperous, can afford to forget.